The song is titled, It Is No Secret. There's a great story behind this song, and I don't have time to tell you about it. But if you'll look it up on the Internet, It Is No Secret. It was written by Stuart Hamlin. I guarantee that you will really like the story. And now we'll try to sing it. Thank you. (coughs) 
All right, let's pray together. Lord, we gather here today not to just go through any routine, uh, not to go through the motions, uh, not to uh, check off the first item on our to-do list of this new week. We come here today to meet with and to relate to and to be with the one true and living God. Lord, for as many of us as are here today, we represent that much of a variety of life circumstances. And we need the one true and living God to be with us as we face life. So we come not to go through the motions, but to worship you and to seek you. To seek your blessing, God. You are welcome in this place, Lord. You are the guest of honor. You are the audience of one. We sing to you today. We pray to you. We give to you. We preach to you today. We pray that you would bless us with your power and presence in our worship service. We need you, God, and we thank you for being here. And we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, one God now and forever. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Since the time of Jesus Christ, the church has been gathering on Sunday mornings to worship. Because Sunday morning is when Jesus Christ arose victorious from the grave. Just by coming to church today, to say nothing of whatever, what else we do with our time here, just coming to church on a Sunday morning itself bears witness to your faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So we're off to a good start today. Amen. Welcome to worship today. My name is Jason. It is my privilege as always to be pastor and preacher here at First Baptist Church of Rock Mart. Very glad to see you here in attendance today. Um, if you're a guest, you're an honored guest, we like to ask our guests if you would take a moment, uh, take a card from the back of the pew in front of you, give us uh, as much contact information as you'd like. If you'd like for us to get back in touch with you, to tell you more about our church, the ways that you might be a part of the life and the, uh, the kingdom work going on at First Baptist Rock Mart, you'll have a, an opportunity as we pass the offering plates later to turn that in. But at any rate, to our home folks and our visitors alike, welcome to worship today. And we will worship today. Let me dispense with a couple of announcements just to give us a sense and to highlight some things that are going on in the life of our church. Uh, first and most immediate, we look forward to a very special evening tonight because tonight we look forward to ordaining Mr. David Walk into the deacon ministry of our church. Um, and and that, that will entail a couple of things tonight. First of all, at 5 o'clock this evening, we're holding an ordination council. To all of our ordained uh, deacons, uh, any other ministers in our church that are ordained, we're inviting you to come at 5 o'clock. Uh, at that hour, we're going to hear a, a word of testimony from David, and we're going to have the opportunity to affirm him on the outset of, of his deacon ministry here at First Baptist Church. Then during the 6 o'clock hour, we'll have our ordination service here in the sanctuary. I'll take the opportunity to, to share a little bit about the, the significance of what it is to be a deacon in God's church. We'll have an opportunity for our whole church to affirm uh, David at that time as well. It'll be a great moment in the life of our church. And so that's coming up tonight. Ordination Council at 5. Ordination Service following at 6. Now, uh, um, since uh, our local schools have been on fall break this week, uh, we're, we're not holding youth activities tonight, but uh, I just wanted to note that beginning this Wednesday night, uh, there's a new Bible study getting underway. It's um, in conjunction with uh, this Tim Tebow's testimony, right, because he's, he's put out an autobiography, and uh, so this is in conjunction with that, and that's 6.30 Wednesday night. Uh, tomorrow night... Uh, the middle school and senior high FCAs uh, are participating in the Fields of Faith event. That's tomorrow night, Rockmart High School. Uh, uh, there's uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches that will be on sale. The program begins at 7. Did I get that right, Mickey? Thank you very much. All right, now uh, look forward with me now to next Sunday morning. That's the next meeting of our monthly men's ministry. Next Sunday morning, 8 a.m., as we usually do, we will have breakfast. All the men of our church, 
all ages. You're invited to come. We will have a special guest next Sunday, um, um, uh, Coach uh, Biff Parson, uh, head football coach here at Rockmart High School, is going to uh, be at our men's ministry meeting. He's going to talk about his life, his journey with Jesus, and how he views uh, coaching as a real ministry. So, again, that's next Sunday morning, 8 a.m., couple more if uh, if you'll allow me here uh, we look forward to October 29th which is our annual fall festival so this is a night of family fun there's some games a lot of activities uh, uh, we're encouraging our kids to dress up in some fun Halloween costumes I think my son is looking forward to being Captain America um, which would be great except he's already he, he goes around the house now hitting his sister with his Captain America shield um, but anyway Captain America will be in attendance that night I think uh, uh, we have a men's chili cook-off and a ladies' homemade desserts challenge that also will take place in conjunction with our fall festival. I look forward to that. Uh, last but not least from me, um, uh, you can see a word of appreciation printed in the bulletin, but let me just reiterate from the pulpit, thank you so much for the love and appreciation you showed our family last Sunday as part of Pastor Appreciation. From the bottom of our heart to your heart, thank you so much. It is our honor uh, as a whole family to be here with you in Rock Mart and at First Baptist Church of Rock Mart. That's enough of me for the moment. Okay, we've got one announcement from Andrew, but also Teresa is going to give an announcement as well. First. Take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have Operation Christmas Child Boxes. I know a lot of you enjoy um, getting boxes and taking them home and doing them yourselves and bring in, um, you know, getting your children and grandchildren to do them with you. So there are boxes out there, and if you've not done them before, we have some packing lists and how to pack a shoe box. They're just on top of the boxes out there. Um, I did want to mention that um, we're having our packing party November 8th. That's the second Wednesday of November. At 6 o'clock, we're having a covered dish meal. Um, at 6.30 is the Operation Christmas Child packing party. Um, the National Collection Week is November 13th through the 20th, so make sure you get your boxes back before then so that I can get them um, over to Bellevue where the collections is for Polk County. So I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Of course, it is, uh, it's, it's midway through October, so it's, uh, it's handbell time again. So anyone who's ev who has ever been a part of handbells, is interested in being part of handbells, please come see me after the service. I'll be right up here. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about uh, maybe a date for, for starting rehearsals up. We always like to do handbells seasonally for Christmas and for Easter time. So uh, we'd love to, do, to uh, talk about that. So if anybody who's interested in handbells, who's done handbells before, or might be interested in handbells, please come see me right here after the service is over. And let's take this opportunity to uh, greet one another this morning. Uh, stand up and... Shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, and let's welcome everybody to, to God's house this morning.
All right, let's start this, uh, this morning's service with uh, a great hymn, number 571. Number 571, Trust and Obey. We'll sing verses 1 and 5 of Trust and Obey, and then be ready to turn over to 572. We'll sing all three verses of Blessed Assurance. Right now, 571, Trust and Obey, verses 1 and 5. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sends we will go, never fear only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. <clears throat> Blessed Assurance, number 572. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Please be seated. If you have a Bible, would you take your Bible and turn in your Bible to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 29. 
verses 10 through 14. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. Once you've found your place there in sacred scripture, I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud. Let's give attention together now to the word of the Lord. For thus says the Lord, When seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand with us as we sing our offertory hymn, which is 549, Higher Ground. Join us as we sing. We'll sing all four verses. Number 549. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My hands on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's dart sets me hard hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven. scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright from still I'll pray till heaven I found Lord lead me on to higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand my faith on heaven's stable land a higher Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for leading this church in the last year. Help guide and direct us in everything we do as a church body and help us lead us down our Christian path. And Father, we wish to uh, bless those people today that are bereaved, Father, those that are sick and ill, 
Those who have personal problems and family problems, be with them, Father. Those people alone, give them company. Those that are traveling, give them safety. And Father, be with our service men, men and women wherever they're serving and bring them home safely. And Father, it's at this time we're going to take part of what you have given us and return it to you through our tithes and our offerings. We ask that it be used to further your word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat>
Please be seated.
All right, if you have your Bible, would you take your Bible again and turn in your Bible this time to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. This is our New Testament reading in our sermon text for this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. And when you found your place there in sacred scripture, again, I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud. Let's give attention again to the word of the Lord. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For five years, I worked as a full time researcher at Samford University back in Birmingham. My boss, the dean of the Divinity School, was constantly writing or preparing to travel and speak. Most days then, my work led me to the campus library to look up some books or articles for Dr. George's latest project. In the Samford Library, at the top of the main staircase leading up to the second floor, on the left, there's a desk. The nameplate... On it says, reference desk. There's also a sign on top of the desk. Please interrupt. Ask me. I'm here to help. If I couldn't find the book or article I was looking for, I knew I could go to that desk and ask the person sitting there, the reference librarian, for help. Reference librarians live to give people what they need to complete their research project. As the sign says, they invite people to seek them out so they can help them. They want people to ask them for help because they want to help. Imagine God sitting on his throne in heaven. And beside his throne there is a sign which reads, Please interrupt. Ask me. I'm here to help. God didn't make the world and then go off by himself to a distant corner of the cosmos, leaving us to our own devices till the end of days. God continues watching over the world. And as he watches, he welcomes us to come to him and ask him for help. Like a loving parent, in fact. He wants to give and provide for his beloved children. As available and able and willing as God is, though, we don't ask like we ought. We don't seek like we should. We don't knock like we need to. The reference librarian is sitting right there, and yet we walk right on by his desk without stopping to ask for help. Some of us just rely on ourselves. Some of us think that we are too busy to stop and talk. Some of us doubt His goodness. Once more, God beckons us to His Word. Let's get into His Word together then and explore God's generosity. According to our text for this morning, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, God gives good things when we ask, so we must ask. A couple of sermons ago, in the last part of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells his disciples to not be 
anxious. Now, starting in chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus explains why they need not worry. Quote, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. In rhythmic fashion, Jesus issues three imperatives. Ask, seek, and knock. In this setting, they are synonymous. They all mean the same thing. Jesus' disciples are welcome to approach God. Like one person who walks up to another to ask a question. Like one person who seeks out another to ask for help. And like one person who knocks on another's door to rouse him to action. Jesus' disciples are welcome to approach God. Not only that... But Jesus assures his disciples they will receive from God when they approach God and request of God. It will be given to you, says Jesus. You will find, says Jesus. It, the figurative door, will be opened to you, says Jesus. Presumably for emphasis... Verse 8 restates indicatively what verse 7 teaches imperatively. Notice that the threefold invitation to ask, seek, and knock in verse 7 is paralleled by the following threefold assurance in verse 8. Quote, For the one who asks will receive. The one who seeks will find. And to the one who knocks, it will be given. Without putting it plainly, it's apparent Jesus is talking about prayer here. Together, verses 7 and 8 constitute a call to pray. And pray boldly at that. Prayer is the way God has ordained for believers to ask of God and to seek God and to knock on His door. It's believers' needs, not so much their wants, Jesus has in mind here. Uh, the, the model prayer Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 6 includes a request for, quote, daily bread, which represents need. When Jesus t- tells his disciples in that same chapter not to worry about what they'll, they'll eat and drink and where he's referring to their needs. In verses 9 and 10, right here in chapter 7, Jesus imagines a son asking his father for bread or fish to satisfy his need for nourishment. From context, then, we can conclude that Jesus is inviting believers in verses 7 and 8 to ask, seek, and knock for what they need. God, says Jesus, wants believers to do more than just believe in him. God wants believers to believe that they are welcome to come to him with their needs. God wants believers to believe that he delights to meet their needs. God wants believers to believe that he will meet their needs. Now, the invitation to ask, seek, and knock does not mean that God depends on believers to make a request before he can meet their need. No, if God wants, he can forego prayers and meet needs all by himself. But he doesn't want to because he wants to relate to believers. This is why God invites believers to pray so they can enjoy the greatest relationship there could ever be. In just a minute, Jesus is going to use an analogy from parenting. Right now, though, I want to say something about grandparenting. Grandparents, help me understand something, please. What is it about having grandkids that makes you, how shall I put it, lose your mind? (laughs) Hmm. Hmm. One time, I was with my parents and my sister's family, and my nephew got in trouble, and so his father took him down the hallway to talk to him and then discipline him. My nephew, of course, didn't want a spanking, so he began protesting, as kids do, as we all probably did. In the midst of my nephew's protests, my mom, my mom, says to my dad regarding their grandson, Richard, go get him. 
go, go get him. I couldn't believe my ears. Suddenly, I'm looking at my parents, and yet I don't recognize my parents. When I was a kid, their kid, and my mom said to my dad, Richard, go get him, that meant I was getting a spanking, not getting saved from one. Grandparents, what is it about having grandkids that makes you, I'm looking for that clinical term, uh, take leave of your senses? Grandbaby arrives, and then all of a sudden, all bets are off. Everything we knew, everything we knew about you, everything we learned about parenting from you, everything we've been practicing as parents ourselves just goes flying out the window with y'all. Whatever grandson wants to do, he does. Bedtime? What bedtime? Wherever granddaughter wants to go, she goes. Sure, honey, we can go to the toy store right now. We haven't been in a couple of days. <laughs> Whatever grandson wants to eat, he eats. Mmm, you're right. Chocolate ice cream for breakfast sounds good to me, too. Whatever granddaughter asks for, she receives. Just don't tell your parents. Am I right, parents of young children and adolescents, or, or am I right? Grandparents, you're killing us. And you're our parents. But aren't you a great picture of God's extravagant invitation to ask and his unfailing promise to give? Consider it. God, the Almighty, creator of the cosmos, king of kings and lord of lords, wants to be with us. He wants to relate to us. He wants to know him. He wants us to know him. As far as this text is concerned, he invites us to come to him with our supplications and he promises to supply us. This is extravagant love. This is a radical relationship. This is amazing grace. Are you asking? Do you ask God about your needs? Do you ask God for what you need and even what you think? you might need? Do you ask God for help to discern your needs? Do you ask God for humility to admit you need it? Because Jesus promises it will be given to you. Are you seeking? Are you seeking? Do you turn to God early and often in your day? Do you turn to God as much as you turn to your other relations? Do you look for God to give according to what he perfectly knows you need when you need it? Because Jesus promises you will find. Are you knocking? Do you dare to take God at his word when he says, come and pray to me? Do you have the holy temerity to venture into God's throne room? Do you rouse the Almighty to action on your behalf as he's promised? Because Jesus promises the door will be opened to you. The prosperity gospel has hijacked this text to claim that God wants us, above all, to be happy and healthy. The persecuted church, though, of which we Americans are all too often too ignorant, begs to differ. God wants us, above all, to be holy, from which happiness and health, as God defines them, follow. This text, then, rather than God's blessing to name and claim whatever we want, is God's bidding for us to search out what He wants for us. Ask Seek, knock, and believe. Pray, and then have faith. Go on from there knowing that God certainly heard you, that he was infinitely delighted to hear from you, and that he utterly thrills to give to you in response. God gives good things when we ask, so we must ask. In verses 7 and 8, Jesus tells his disciples to ask, seek, and knock, expecting God to give. 
Now, in verses 9 through 11, Jesus explains why they can count on God to give when they petition him. Jesus explains by use of an analogy. An analogy is a comparison between two things that helps to explain and clarify one of them. In this case, Jesus employs an analogy from parenting to explain why believers can count on God to give when they petition him. Or which one of you, Jesus asks in verse 9, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? This is another rhetorical question from Jesus. That is, he's not really asking a question, but he's making a point in the form of a question. The point here is that when a child asks their parent for something they need, like bread for food, their parent is not going to give them something useless, like a stone, which obviously doesn't satisfy their need for nourishment. No, any parent that truly cares about their child is going to give them what they need. Or, Jesus asks in verse 10, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. It's the same kind of question Jesus asks in verse 9, which means he's emphasizing his point by repeating it. There's a noticeable difference, though, in the imagery in verse 10. In this instance, Jesus imagines a son asking their parent for something they need, only to receive something dangerous, a serpent. That's absurd, of course, which amplifies Jesus' point that any parent that truly cares about their child is going to give them what they need. In verse 11, Jesus states the point of his parenting analogy. Quote, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give to those, give good things to those who ask? Earthly parents, says Jesus, though sinful, still supply what their children need. That being so, believers can trust that God, their heavenly Father, the perfect and infallible parent, will always and ever supply what his children need when they ask. Jesus, in verse 11, refers to, quote, good gifts and good things. These references recall his remark from Matthew 6, 33, that, quote, all these things will be added to you. Now, in that text, Jesus clearly has material things in view. Here, though, while material things are presumably part of the good that God wants to give, the wording allows for a broader understanding. God has not just material, but immaterial things like virtues that he wants to give as well. As the perfect parent, says Jesus, God wants to give good things to those he asks. Not only that, but the analogy also suggests that God, as the perfect parent, knows best what those good things are. Even as believers ask then, and even as they believe that God will give, they must leave it to God's ultimate wisdom to ultimately determine what good things they truly need. I was joking with you grandparents about losing your mind over your grandkids. The truth is, and you grandparents know this because you were parents prior, having kids wrecks us parents too. The writer Elizabeth Stone said, Making the decision to have a child is momentous. It is to decide forever to have your heart go walking around outside your body. Ain't that the truth? Having kids changes us parents right along with grandparents. Our two kids, James and Lucy, are so young, they still need a lot from us at this stage of their lives. Now, I can hear some of you saying, Jason, you better get a grip, because that's true of every stage of life. Point taken. James has been able to articulate his needs for some time now, while Lucy is is just now getting there. Neither one, though, is shy about coming to us and asking. When, When James walks up 
and he asks for something. I feel the love in my heart well up all over again. And when Lucy, Lucy Joy, walks up and asks for something, I'm overcome with happiness and joy once more. Like some of you, I'm sure, I even get emotional now when I read the text about a parent giving their child a stone instead of bread and a serpent instead of fish. Why would someone do that? I ask indignantly. How could someone do that to their own child? I'm not a perfect parent. But since I find in myself the desire, since I find in my sorry and sinful self the desire to give good things to James and Lucy, And since I want them to know, they can always come to me and ask. And since I want them to believe, they will always receive when they request. I've learned all over again just who the perfect parent is. It's Michelle. (laughs) I'm I'm kidding. Um, I'm going to answer for that one later. Michelle is an awesome parent. She's doing a great job raising me right along with our two kids. But of course it's God. God is the perfect parent. I have learned all over again that God is the perfect parent. As already mentioned, God is creator and king and Lord, but he's also parent the father to be exact in fact he's the best parent there is god parents us perfectly when it comes to this text that means first of all god longs and loves to give us what we need his heartbeat is for our well-being As immeasurably deep as any earthly parent's longing and love goes for their children, God's goes that much deeper. As the perfect parent, God never fails to meet us with just what we need. That isn't to say God always gives us the thing we think we need, but He always gives us the right thing. God doesn't give us something useless or dangerous because that's contrary to His character. As all-loving and all-powerful, God can't give us anything less than the right thing. So when you go to God in prayer, do not let any doubt creep in that God is guessing about how to get back to you. Remember, he already knows what you're going to say. He just wants to hear you say it as an expression of your desire to relate to him as your heavenly father. Now, be ready, though. Be ready for God to get back to you with something other than what you have in mind. Whether it's an amount of money or a positive outcome or a particular virtue, God might figure that we need it differently than the way we asked. Or he might figure that we need something else. Then again, God might give just what we asked for, just the way we asked for it. When God gets back to us, his perfect wisdom ensures it'll be right on. The old saying goes, God, don't make no junk. That means... God makes each and every one of us on purpose and for a purpose. Well, God don't give no junk either. Everything God gives is likewise on purpose and for a purpose. His good gifts and good things are good because they are purposely given and given for a purpose. God gives good things when we ask, so we must ask. Ask, seek, and knock, says Jesus. It will be given to you. You will find. It will be opened to you, says Jesus. Jesus is talking, of course, about the here and now. 
That's the first and most immediate application of our text for this morning. As the ever-present God, God is interested and invested in what's happening with us as we come and go and carry on with our lives this very day right here in Rockmart and the surrounding area. But there's more. See, besides the here and now, there's also then and there. When Jesus beckons us to ask, and when he promises it will be given to you, he's got our greatest need in mind too. As the everlasting God, God wants to give us what we need.